Hello everybody, uh, we are happy to be here with Ali. Um, we're going to talk about customer experience and of course with the tool that we all love, the tool that we all use, the tool that save our lives during uh, this crisis moment. And if you have questions, of course, feel free to ask them in the chat. And if uh, we feel uh, that they are smart enough, <laughs> I'm joking, <laughs> we answer it. No, uh, if we feel uh, that uh, uh, we have the answer, uh, Ali, uh, Ali, you see the, the, the questions, you pick the one mm -hmm. that you like. Uh, let's start together because we are, I am a little bit late. And That's no, fine. Your time is precious. How do you feel? We had a great chat before this. How are you? Um, I'm really good. Yes. It's yes. it's always strange to say that right now, but like you know, I'm healthy and I'm safe and uh, getting some work done. And I'm here with you, which is awesome. So thank happy you. to be here. Thank you, Ali. The things you know, the things are a little bit different here in, in Europe. It's 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 uh, already you know deconfinement. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it, like the the the, the slow and slow, slowly mm -hmm. by step the business is coming back. And uh, we 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 are not going through the same uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, social uh, uh, awakening uh, than in the, uh, the mm -hmm. US. My my sister lives in uh, Los Angeles, so uh, okay, I know every day, and 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 and, and she's very uh, activist. You know, she's very uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I know the tension, and uh, yeah, I'm supporting you. I want to thank you. Um, you are in San Francisco. I am in San Francisco. Yeah. And um, so I'm just a little bit north of Los Angeles. Cool. So you, Ali, I am so happy that you are here. Thank you. Oh, thank Mary. you. I'm so happy to be here. Really. You've been working with Slack since the very beginning. It's true. In its scale, mm -hmm. from an internal tool to a public company with mm -hmm. millions of daily active users. So my yep. first question to you. Mm -hmm. what has stayed true mm -hmm. since the beginning mm -hmm. and what has changed in mm -hmm. your approach of customer experience because it is a topic today and that's your, your main focus. Yeah, um, super good question. So, you know, one thing that we realized really early on about Slack was that this is a business of trust. So our customers need to trust that our product will be available and reliable. They need to trust that... Um, you know, we'll keep their data secure and they need to trust that we've got their back. And this was really the founding principle of how we do customer experience, how we run um, my department, how we treat our customers. So, um, you know, we think about Slack, when you think about Slack, it's not something you can do on your own. So if you want to adopt another tool like Trello to track your tasks, for example, you can do that all on your own. You don't need to get your teammates on board. But with Slack, you can't do this on your own. You have to go around and say like, hey there, what if we worked completely differently? What if we you know, stripped out all of the things that we know about email and we put this other product in the middle instead and we've never used it before and it's kind of strange, but, but trust me, like that is a big thing to ask of your coworkers. Like you are burning um, some of your political and social capital within your company to get our product started within a company. So, um, you know, we're like, okay, people, every single time a team starts within a company, somebody is putting their neck on the line for us. And it is our responsibility to be behind them. It's our responsibility to make sure they have everything they need because they're the ones that, you know, like they put their trust in us. And so ever since that first moment, we're like, cool, Anybody who needs our help, we are going to make it as easy as possible to contact us. We are going to do our best to um, support them. And it doesn't matter if they're free or paid, like they all matter. So that's remained the same. Um, obviously, the things that are different are volume. There's just a lot more of it. We handle a lot more tickets. We hear from a lot more customers. Um, and also kind of how we, the things that customers say um, has changed as we've gotten customers in more uh, verticals, so different kinds of industries, different sizes of companies, different countries. Like when we started, GDPR didn't exist, mm. and now it does. Um, when we started, we hadn't 
really thought about um, regulated financial industries. And now we do, and we support them. So the breadth and depth of how people use our product and what they need out of it has really changed. So it's no longer just um, product support, like here's how you upload an emoji, but um, there's a lot more in-depth stuff that we have to understand about our customer's business to make them successful. Mm. And you at the very beginning, when you decided to join uh, Slack, uh, mm -hmm. you understood already fully the product, you knew how, how impactful, how disruptive it would become? So when I joined the company, um, I don't know how many people know this, this was a video game company. Yeah. So before Slack, um, we were making a video game called Glitch. It was um, an adorable and weird game. It had people who loved it, but like not enough. Um, it wasn't going to be a successful business, even though it was a successful game. And so we shut that down and realized like, okay, this thing that we built to talk to one another, um, this is, this is actually a business in and of itself because we can't imagine working without this tool ever again. And therefore maybe some other people will find it useful as well. And that's when we started, um, we shut down the game and we started building Slack. And um, I had used a lot of like real time messaging tools at other jobs. So I knew the power. And like when I joined the company, I was like, oh yeah, like I understand this. Um, so I believed in it like right away. And there was no question in my mind that there would be value because I'd always found value in similar systems. That's crazy because you joined for a game and you stayed for a, a, the, the, the chat. That, that. Yes. Yeah, um, like I had done uh, enterprise software startups my entire career. This is my seventh. It's no longer a startup, but this is my seventh startup. And uh, I was like, man, I'm kind of tired of enterprise software because the thing about most enterprise software is that your customers hate your changes. Like when you build software, you want to build stuff and you want to make it better and you want to improve things. But ultimately you're putting a tool in um, the hands of your end users that they just use to get their jobs done. They're not looking for like fun new bells and whistles. So the thing that you love to do, which is build is the thing that actually disrupts their work and makes it harder to do it. And so I was like, yeah, let's step back from enterprise software. Let's do some more consumer stuff. Mm games seem cool. Um, and here I am back in enterprise software. But this time it's super gratifying because people love the enhancements that we make. Like we're doing uh, a good job of delivering what people need to make their work better. Yes. And, and we can feel that in the way the, 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 the product is designed itself, there is a lot of not B2C, but a lot of uh, a spontaneity and simplicity mm -hmm. that we can feel in, in, in the B2C product, basically, more than an enterprise product, if mm -hmm. I may, you know. Uh, there is this approach that is very, very uh, uh, human friendly, mm -hmm. like, as if the tool was talking to us directly. Yeah, it's, um, you know, one thing that the pandemic has made even more clear and has brought into um, even sharper focus is human connection. Uh, people are recognizing that like all of those conversations or all of those relationships that existed through casual conversations, like you run into someone in the hallway, you just grab lunch with them, whatever, like we don't have those anymore. And just broadly, there are concerns about like, what does this mean for innovation within my company? What does this mean for relationships? How do we get new people on board when we don't have these um, physical spaces to facilitate loose human social connection and so even though that so even though um slack has always been a space to kind of facilitate that and we've always wanted that to be part of it because connecting with other people is how work gets done um it's even more important now that we kind of built it in to be this more spontaneous like human product rather than just like type on your computer to do work totally people are hacking their ways through the technology, through the existing platform, to actually mm -hmm. refill, uh, I mean, overcome the distance and, and mm -hmm. build that connection. So we are reinventing yeah. the way we chat, even. We are. Um, so one of the things that has become really important um, to a lot of customers is social channels. So places that you talk about stuff, and one of um, one of the ones, I don't know if this happened in France, but in the US, everybody started baking bread. Everybody was like, suddenly I'm going to bake artisan bread. Um, a baking channel was spun up. 
and we have hundreds of people posting pictures of their sourdough loaves and like lots of advice on starters and like oven spring. Uh, like this has nothing to do with work, but folks are bonding over like a shared learning experience, which is really, really important for bonds. Like, um, and you know, it's good to post a picture of your awesome loaf and have everyone be like, wow, that's a beautiful loaf of bread. Uh, so we're seeing those um, social interactions become really important. We're also seeing the use of like apps and bots to facilitate those internal sort of connections. Like there's one called Donut. Um, it will like you put, you make a channel, you put Donut in the channel and every week or every month, whatever you choose, Donut will be like you and you go have a half hour conversation. So it just creates these random pairings. Oh, it's randomly. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. serendipity, pure serendipity. Yeah. And it's not totally random. It's a little bit smart. So it's going to try to pair you up with somebody that it's pretty sure you don't talk with very often. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's even better. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. And when you started at Slack, you were not officially like the customer experience. I mean, the, the, the one, no. You, what were you doing when you started? Um, I have a background in software engineering and quality. Mm. So um, this is actually my very first job um, officially doing anything, uh, you know, customer related. But I have always like, I've always wanted to build software for people. I like building things that people use. It's not an abstract um, exercise for me. So with my quality lens, um, I was never very interested in like, the test plan as much as I was interested in the customer experience of the product. So for example, when I started at the video game, um, the first thing that I wanted to get my hands on was our support tool, not our bug database. Like bug database can come later. It's a list of all the problems we know. But what our customers are saying, that's a list of all the problems that they're actually having. And throughout my career, I have always been customer facing. Like all of my engineering jobs, talking to customers, all of my quality jobs, talking to customers. So as Slack started to get traction and we started to have people coming in and saying, I need some help, um, there were eight of us at Slack. It was Stuart, our CEO, six engineers, and me. And like we needed to talk to these customers. And I was like, I mean, I've never done this as a job, but I can do it, so I'll do it. Uh, and then I picked it up, and it's been mine ever since. And, and, and what, what kind of skill does it re require to be actually able to actively listen to people? I mean, do you have to be uh, psychologically more you know, sensitive or uh, to, to, to really take into account the, the, and to understand what the people want? Because there is what they say, mm -hmm. there is what they mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there is what they really think. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in terms of like emotions, since we are a business product, people usually bring their professional selves to us. So unlike um, consumer support where people deal with a lot of like very angry people all the time, our customers are usually like pretty chill. They're fine. Um, there's a... One thing that product managers learn really early on in their career is when a customer says, I want your product to do this, that's a solution. And what you've got to do is unwind that solution to figure out what problem they want to solve and then put on your product management lens and play it back forward to be like, how do we solve this in our product? Not how does this customer think that it should be solved, but how do I think it should be solved? And how do we build that so that it is appropriate for the long-term thing that we're building. So it's appropriate for our whole customer base. Like what does this landscape look like? And this is something that um, we have to do in support as well, because people will say like, you know, I want, um, I want this button to do this instead. And our job is not to go to product and say this button should do this, but our job is to be like, cool, what are you trying to do with that button? Get that answer. And then we can go to the product management team and be like, our customers are finding that they can't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can solve that problem instead rather than just implementing a solution. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, let's go back a little bit on uh, the, the, on Slack and the, the mm -hmm. like what, if you had to, to describe the, the, the main values, like the key values uh, uh, at Slack, what, what are mm -hmm. they? Um, key values like of our yeah. product, our customers, or internally to ourselves? Uh, I would say both, actually. Okay. okay. 
Um, so the value that Slack brings to organizations is um, its agility. And if I kind of break that down out of business speak into how humans talk, um, we, if everybody in a company has the same goals, if they know where they're going, and if everybody in a company has access to the same information, um, then they all start understanding how things fit together. They all start making the same decisions independently and they can work more independently. Um, so rather than information being kind of, you know, siloed often accidentally, um, information is broadly available and people can say, I need to know what we're doing over here so that I can know, so I can know what to do in my job. Um, usually that would be like, hey there, do you have any documents? And it's an email and then they're like, no, but talk to that guy. Like it's a bunch of emails yeah. going back and forth. Um, it's people being accidentally left off email threads. But in Slack, they can say like, I need to know what's going on with the widget project. They can go to the widget channel, they can catch up. It's um, everybody loves being independent and yeah. self-sufficient at work. That's how we succeed. Like we love feeling like we are successful at work. So Slack brings a lot of power to individuals. And when you give that power to individuals, you amplify the output and the um, sort of function functioning of the team and the company. Mm. So that's what we bring. Um, internally, we um, we really value teamwork. So we value collaboration. Um, we have, uh, right now, especially solidarity, solidarity with one another, standing with one another, um, having each other's backs. Uh, empathy is a value that radiates both inwards and outwards. Uh, and one thing that we talk about a lot is you know, behind every customer is a human. Like there is somebody who, especially right now, like maybe friends and family are um, sick with COVID. Maybe they have kids running underfoot and they're trying to do conference calls. Maybe they're stressed out because their business is struggling because, you know, and on and on and on. So Slack is the center of our universe. We care a whole lot about it. Slack is not the center of anybody else's universe. Like we are just one part of them trying to get through their day. And that empathy of recognizing that um, we just have a supporting role to play in them being successful is uh, like, it's something that's hugely grounding for us and how, like how we view ourselves in our customers' lives. We can feel it in the product it itself, actually, this, this yeah. way of being, this way of yeah. thinking. Uh, I would say even humble, like you are not talking about Slack never uh, uh, on the product. I mean, it's really for the teams to be able to work with mm -hmm. it. And then it's, mm -hmm. it's really, and then I think that's part of the success of the brand as well, because mm -hmm. people are so happy to, 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 as you said, to be more independent, to be, to be working more efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, they choose to love a Slack for that. And it's not Slack telling them, love me. There is something like that. Um, how, how, okay, I have a, a question for you. How early, uh, how, like uh, when actually, have you been starting uh, uh, creating a, a team dedicated to customer experience? Mm -hmm. Because we have a, a lot of uh, early stage founders in the audience mm -hmm. and uh, they are thinking of, uh, you know, uh, how to approach customer experience in the, the very beginning? Um, you have to have someone whose job it is as soon as you have customers who need to talk to you. Mm. And I think um, once you hit that point, you have to ask yourselves, like, who are we to these customers? Like, how are we going to show up, especially for an early stage company? Mm. Um, your customers are going to have probably just one touch point with you and that's your website or your product. If they have another one, it's your support. So if they need something from you, um, that's the only other touch point you have. They're not gonna have, you, you probably don't have like a lot of out of home advertising, you're not running banner ads, there's not a lot of PR, like people don't have a sort of rich universe of um, assets and touch points to build up an impression of your brand. So that's it, it's the product they touch and it's the support that they get. And if the product is awesome, but they feel like the people behind it are jerks, then every time they open up the product, they're going to be like, I don't really feel great about this company. They're kind of rude. And so for me, a lot of this has been, um, how does this become a seamless experience? So what does it mean when somebody has this sort of 
feeling of Slack? And you talked about this a lot. Like, what is the feeling of Slack? Mm. Does, when you open that window and you go to a channel, like, how do you, how are you feeling? And then it's like, what does this mean in a support interaction? Who are the, like, what is the voice and who are the people that support that? Um, and so for us, it was people who are extraordinarily um, well-spoken. This is a business product. So you want business folks showing up behind it. Um, people who can you know, speak succinctly and clearly. People who have a profound amount of empathy because our product is built with a lot of empathy. That's got to shine through in the interactions that people have with us. And so back to the like very tactical question of when do you build this department? Um, Somebody's got to own it, but at the very beginning, it's not going to be a full-time job. Mm. And the trick there is to, and I did this poorly, the trick there is to watch out for when it becomes a full-time job because it is um, very tactical. It's very dynamic. There are lots of things happening all the time that are urgent. Like you've got to get back to your customers. And this will suck all the oxygen out of the room for whatever other job you do. So for a long time, I owned both customer experience and quality. Oh. And um, support was just, you know, absorbing all of my time because it was the thing that always had to go. And I, um, you know, I didn't have enough energy or time to give quality the same, you know, sort of support that it needed. And that's one thing that I would watch out for because support is just gonna like, it will absorb somebody. And once it becomes absorbing somebody, like it's got to be their job. And then, you know, again, back to like, who do you need to be for your customers? There are some products where it's going to be totally fine if you don't get back to people within, you know, an hour. Hmm. But for us, if somebody's having problems with Slack, they can't get their job done. And our entire purpose as a company is to help people work better at work. So we've got to take care of that. Like, it's not okay for us to be like, yeah, we'll just staff in North America and Europe can wait until like we would. No, it's not okay. So we had to build an organization that would meet our customers where they were, which is globally, um, so we could get them back to work. I mean, it's, for me, it's more that you're, you're taking seriously your role, but there are many mm -hmm. tools that are very useful who will mm -hmm. take the time to answer back. But you take very seriously the fact that it's impossible to admit that uh, more than one hour we, we cannot use the tool. And we, we feel this as well as yeah. users. There is a, a, a direct answer. Um, would you say that you have some design rules? And would you share some with us? Like uh, um, you were talking about uh, how when you you you, you go uh, tell the, the product team what mm -hmm. customer wants like mm -hmm. what makes you take a decision like mm -hmm. to go one way or another yeah that's um that's one of the things that's evolved and become more complex over time as we've grown so at the very beginning we just we used to have a channel where every support ticket came in and all eight of us read every support ticket and we had conversations about a lot of them. Those conversations were like, wow, this is a great idea. I hadn't thought about that. Or, hmm, is this something that we would do? And then that would spawn like really good conversations about the future of the product and where we were going and what did or did not fit. Like those questions clarified a lot of our early thinking. Um, this one doesn't come up anymore, but kind of rewind about six years and think about where we were with the cloud. Like people still very much wanted on-premise solutions. Hmm. And that was one of the early questions we got a lot. And a support ticket came in and was like, you know, can we get this on-prem? And we had a great conversation about it. Um, obviously, this doesn't work anymore. We can't have over 2,000 people reading every support ticket that comes in. Um, so kind of in the interim, we've had to find more and more ways to aggregate, classify, um, you know, generalize and raise issues from customers. Mm. And uh, our current iteration, we have folks who um, they no longer directly support customers, but they're responsible for understanding one area of our product and everything that's coming in through support. Um, and then working with the product and engineering teams on a daily basis to make sure that we are doing the things that matter the most to our customers.
-hmm. And that program has been really, really successful. We've been running it for, I think, nine months at this point. Cool, cool. And, and, and just thinking back of your, what you were saying about uh, the, 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 how exhausting it can be in terms of energy to, 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 mm -hmm. at, uh, to the support uh, team, uh, would you recommend, for instance, to a startup to mix, like to, to have people uh, from the support team uh, going like, let's say, if it's possible, uh, two hours uh, uh every day and do other things the rest of the uh, day for instance to mix one thing that was really important for us at the beginning was for everybody to do support and like literally everyone in the company hopped in and did support up until we reached like 150 or 200 employees um when you are early on you hire a bunch of people who can wear a lot of hats they do a lot of different things And we needed the company, like as you brought in new people in these very foundational stages of the company, we needed to really immerse people in who our customers were and who we were building for. Like that's the only way that you see the future of your company is to know who you are, like who needs your product and why. Mm. Uh, we do our absolute best to build in a lot of flexibility to the um, schedule of our support personnel because Nobody, there are very few people who can just pound out tickets all day. Like it is a hard thing to do. There are some people and they are gems. Um, they love it. Like this is their happy place. They're like, please just give me a full queue of tickets and a quiet space to work. And they will just plow through it. Um, for most of us, and I'm one of these people, like I need a little variety. I need to step back, um, learn something, write something up, teach somebody something. And we do build um, a fair amount of flexibility into jobs. So, um, you know, sometimes a customer is going to need three hours of your time because they have a complex problem. And that is totally cool. And those hard problems are actually kind of good breaks from the day to day, um, the day to day work. You end up going to talk to engineers a lot. You talk to product management a lot. Um, you come up with something that suits what the customer needs. And That's like that's a lot of how we work. It's what does a customer need rather than like what number am I supposed to hit? Because if you have a complex problem and I have 10 minutes to solve it, you're not going to get your problem solved. Totally. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Very, very, very simple. Very, very uh, um, uh, interesting. Everybody goes to the support. At the mm -hmm. At the beginning, I guess. Okay. What? Um, so you've pre you 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 you've done a recent uh, redesign uh, of mm -hmm. the product uh, on Slack. Uh, how you've been working on it, like on the support side? Mm -hmm. um, it's rolling out something that big. It takes a lot of internal preparation. So for that UI refresh, um, we had been working for a couple of months with the team putting together the UI. Um, you know, obviously, within Slack, we have the benefit that very few companies have of just living in our product all the time. Yeah. So we've been living in our changes for months, and we've been testing them. And like things moved around in the interface every day. You you know walk in, open your laptop, and you're like. Oh, that button moved over here and oh, this menu now, like there was a lot of sort of adjusting. Um, but as we did this, the design team would be like, this is locked, like this menu is done. Um, so part of my department is also our help center. So all the online documentation that you find at help.slack.com. So that team could be like, cool, this section's done. We're going to start taking screenshots. We're going to start localizing it. Um, We're going to, you know, start updating all the text to say, like, this is here and this is how you do this. Uh, at the same time, somebody from um, within the support side would start putting together documentation for the support team to say, like, you know, this button has moved here. And if you need to do X, you do it this way. Hmm. Uh, so lots of internal training. But the benefit, again, of us using our product all the time is that we kind of knew all of it because we've just been using it. So it wasn't we did have to learn it, but we got to learn it by using it rather than by like having a bunch of enablement documentation. A lot of companies don't have that luxury and you're going to have to do a much heavier lift around documenting and teaching people what's new.
Mm. Okay, let's focus a little bit on customer experience and, and, and mm. how how it can impact the business and how, especially at Slack, do you measure it? Do you have your own ways to measure mm. if you're on the right track when it comes to uh, customer experience? What kind of tools, process uh, have you uh, implemented to, to, to follow? Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, we have a few different measurements. Um, we run CSAT, so just how do we do up, down, um, we have started sending out customer effort score surveys. So this is um, it's kind of like NPS, but for support. And the question there is like, how easy was it for you to solve your problem today? And what we're trying to get to there, um, people may be happy with the end result, but it may have been very hard for them to get there. So we're trying to understand like, where are the, where are the areas of our support experience where our customers have to do too much work and how do we fix those? And so a lot of those are actually accomplished through engineering and product changes. And one really great example, um, in the past, if you wrote us and said, I can't connect, we'd be like, cool, please go to this link. It'll run a test and then send us the results. But now um, what you do is you, know, you go to our forum, you say, I can't connect. We automatically just run that test and get the results so that you don't have to do it. And so we're constantly looking for ways to cut out work that we're asking our customers to do and just have computers do it for us automatically. Um, so another thing that we do, we have um, we have like a artificial intelligence tool that ingests the content of tickets and tries to figure out like, what are people writing in about? Are they happy or sad? Um, we have a huge dashboard of metrics that tells us like, you know, it breaks tickets down by um, what they're about. So like, is it about Android or is it about emoji and how long it takes us to solve those tickets um, how many back and forth we have to do with our customers so like I'm looking at a huge data universe and, and then obviously we have you know managers looking at actual tickets and being like mm -hmm. this one hit the mark and we need to do some changes here and so we have this universe of data that we're looking at there's not one single source of truth that tells me we are doing an awesome job or a poor job there is um there are a lot of signals to look at. And then finally, um, you know, we have a, the support or our business model is freemium. Like folks decide to try Slack, they can use it for free forever. We're not gonna, you know, go in and try to upsell them. Um, but we wanna make sure that the folks who contact us while they're on the free plan have everything they need. And so another success metric is like, how many people convert after contacting us? Ah, it's a good one. Okay, uh, I have a last question before you you choose the two because we, the people are asking questions. But I have a, a, one last question regarding uh, uh, how it's been for Slack uh, during uh, COVID in terms of uh, usage. I mean, uh, many, 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 many people has been uh, using Slack because they had no other choice basically. They discovered uh, Slack. How have you been uh, uh, managing this new demand? And, in um, taking care of these uh, mm -hmm. people, there were so many. So, you, how it's been for you? Uh, it was busy for a while. So, March was very, very, very busy. Um, April also very busy. It's it's starting to calm down. Um, Slack is a strange product. Like, if you have never used anything like Slack before, and then you drop into Slack, you're like, what? What's a channel? What's a workspace? What am I doing here? How do I like? There's a lot to understand, and we know this, and we need to do a better job of helping people through our product, and we're working on this. Um, we rolled out a bunch of stuff um, over the last couple of months to help, but we know that folks getting started on Slack need support. Like That's when people are most likely to contact us, so we were busy. And um, one interesting thing that happened, so obviously we have a lot of offices, and we have staff that supports those offices, who did not need to go into an office to support anymore, but they are excellent at working with customers because their company was their customer. Like all of us employees in our offices, we were their customers. So we're like, hey, you wanna like come on over and help us support our company's customers? So we actually gained basically um, most of our workplace team who supports our offices to work with customers. So oh, cool. Our finance team came to me and said, like, would you like to accelerate your hiring? And I was like, yes, I would. So we started hiring faster. We brought on a lot of people. Um, 
And I think the tough message for people, like number one for all of our employees, including support, it was like, take care of yourself, take care of your family, be safe. If you need some time, you can take it. Um, we aren't logging sick time. We are not going to deny you a day off. Like, please take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so for the support team to hear that message alongside, like, it's very important for all these people to use our product and they all need help was a, a tough thing for people to juggle. Um, and that was like, those are leadership moments where you're just like, nope, it's fine. We're going to figure out the work part. You figure out the you part. Um, we are through that tough period now. Like things have settled down. We're cool. We always see, um, you know, people go on vacation, especially Europe. You guys are excellent at going on summer vacation. <laughs> quiets down for us a little bit. Um, expect to see people start roaring back in the fall. So we're, we're getting into that, um, you know, post-COVID surge period. And also, I'm not, are, are you going to take a vacation this summer? Like, can you go anywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We reopen. We are reopening the the, the the borders a little bit, and you can count on the the French at least uh, in August to, oh. <laughs> yeah. to go to go anywhere. If we cannot go, uh, oh, I think Greece is open already. Uh, Spain and and, and Italy, and uh, it's, we won't go far, but we will go. Okay. Well. Uh, we see that in our numbers every year. We're like, oh, on vacation now. August is a dead month in France. Yes, it is. For sure. Okay, Ali, thank you very much. What kind of question would you like to pick? Because we have a lot of comments from different people from all parts of the world. Uh, you, you choose yourself. Do you choose your favorite question and your answer? Maybe maybe one or two, because I know you, yeah. you don't have so much time. Um, there's one, let's pick this one up from Aishara. Um, how do you think customer success and customer support vary, although they point towards the same goal of building a good customer experience? I love how you phrase that because it's so true. Like they're all building towards the same thing. Um, when I think of customer success, I think of helping businesses build the system around your product. So, there, it's only in a very small company that you can drop in a tool and just kind of have it work without any um, support of all the employees. As you start putting your product into larger and larger organizations, um, those organizations have to make sense of what this tool means for all of their employees. And when I think about customer success, it's, um, you know, for us, it's going in and really understanding, like, what is your business? Who are your employees? How's your business structure? What do you need to get out of our product? Um, and how can we use our kind of unparalleled knowledge of what our product can do to make sure that it is suiting your needs, to make sure that it is meeting your employees where they are, to make sure that you, know, you have the systems that you need to continue to be successful with it. And so these are overarching programs that touch, you know, sometimes large parts of a company, increasingly an entire company, uh, if you roll out Slack, for example, at IBM for 360,000 people, it's very different than rolling out Slack for a startup of six people. So I think of customer success as these programs that understand the customer and kind of the whole of what an e enormous employee base needs out of it um, and really gets the product and the change management in a place where it can be successful. Um, support is much, much more tactical so my department rarely, you know, gets into the details of like, I'm trying to manage this change effort for a 20,000 person department. Like we don't usually get into those details. We'll find out that it's 20,000 people and we'll find out that they're having a user group problem, but we don't know the details of that, but that's okay because we just need to get them through that one roadblock and they have, um, you know, they'll have a customer success manager working with them for the overall rollout. And our teams work closely together. Um, obviously, support doesn't have the expertise to do change management for a huge rollout. Um, customer success doesn't have all of the nitty gritty details of everything about how our product works because they're focused on huge rollouts. So these are um, like, it's a good pairing, but it's too much for one person to pack in their heads. So we've got to kind of separate those out. And so that's kind of how that works and the difference for me. Mm. All right, very, very cool answer. Thank you, Ali. Uh, another one maybe you want to pick? 
Hmm, I have a lot. Let's see here. Yes, you have to, you have to choose. That's hard. I know. <sighs> Let's see, how do you keep teams not directly in touch with the customer involved in delighting them? Uh, so much of this is internal communications. So, um, you know, one thing that we, well, let's go back to the UI refresh. So that was a huge effort and it's scary. Like we have all seen what happens when Twitter changes their avatars to be circles or when Facebook changes the color of blue a little bit. Like. People don't like it when you change the way that their software looks, and especially when you move stuff around. And we moved a lot of stuff around, um, and that's scary. And it's one thing that our brains do is um, we heavily weight negative comments over positive comments. So we can have 10 things come in that are like, this is wonderful, I love it, this is great. And then one thing that comes in that's like, this is garbage, you are morons, I hate you, you have destroyed my life and everyone gets stuck on that one bad comment. And so a lot of this for us is making sure that we are reaching the folks in the company who did the work to be like, your work mattered. Especially when we have those examples. Um, and during, the, um, during COVID, it was really important to be like, here's a, like, here's a nonprofit that was you know, helping, in, um, helping in a region that needed a ton of help. They weren't using Slack, they are now using Slack. The changes you made to make our interface understandable for them means that they understood files faster. And now they're sharing the photos that they need to share, like finding those very specific examples to say like the work that you did mattered, especially when it's work that was kind of scary to release or something that's you know not going to be received well, super, super important. 